gentle and of course very modern apes, today we are here to respond to a series of articles that an intelligent design website called Evolution News put out about me as a response to a video that I made a few months ago covering their article on primate phylogeny. That's right, this is now the world's stupidest and lamest drama channel. So I thought what we would do today is read through these articles, assessing them critically, both in relation to my previous video and also to the intelligent design movement as a whole. The first article is titled, I Got Critiqued by YouTuber Gutsick Gibbon. The agony of one's descriptor being YouTuber. But at least I'm the envy of 75% of 6 to 17 year olds in the United States today. We might be in trouble, you guys. The author Emily Reeves is instantly winning me over here with this absolutely idyllic picture of an agile gibbon or Hylobates agilis. And I gotta say, I really appreciate the way that Emily has gone about kind of writing this article. She does so in a kind of tongue in cheek way. I feel that this is very much in line with the type of content that I try to do here. So let's go ahead and get started with this bad boy. As you can see, I left a like because I did in fact like this article. <laughs> I got critiqued by YouTuber Gutsick Gibbon by Emily Reeves. She is indeed the author of the original article that we covered back in this video that you can see that I'm hopefully putting on the screen now, which was Evolution News' attempt to cover the statistical evidence for primate common ancestry. We're going to get to more of that here in a minute. She notes, Earlier this year, a popular evolution YouTuber, Gutsick Gibbon or Erica, created a video response to my post here at Evolution News. Do statistics prove common ancestry? Oh, you're buttering me up here, Emily. Popular evolution YouTuber? My. I had reviewed a paper by Baum et al. 2016, Statistical Evidence for Common Ancestry, Application to Primates, and how it presents a flawed and weak argument for separate ancestry that ignores the possibility of common design. Guys, we're going to get to the details of the criticisms here in a minute, but we're just getting started, so bear with me. Erica is currently pursuing her Master's of Research in Primate Biology, Behavior, and Conservation and is the creator of hundreds of punchy, entertaining YouTube videos. Her channel's primary focus seems to be on debunking Darwin's skeptics. So far, I love this article. This is 10 out of 10. We got a given picture. We got being nice to me. These are pretty much the only two things that need to be present for me to like something. There was one mistake there. I have now achieved my master's of research in primate biology behavior and conservation, but I didn't update my YouTube like info blurb for a while. So this is not Emily's fault. I'm currently pursuing my PhD in biological anthropology. So let's continue here. Unfortunately, uh-oh, she does not seem to apply an equally critical eye to evolutionary theory. While Erica confidently affirms the conclusions of Baum et al. 2016 in multiple videos, here, here, and here, we love to see the citing of the sources, her responses do not negate the arguments raised in my initial post. So we're going to keep reading, and once we're kind of finished with this little section here, we're going to go ahead and revisit the arguments that I actually made so that we can see if I did or did not address Emily's criticisms and how she does in this article addressing mine. An initial disclaimer. Before going forward, I want to remind you that intelligent design is compatible with both common ancestry and non-common ancestry views. Some of my colleagues here at the Discovery Institute support common ancestry, while others, like myself, are more skeptical. That's okay. We all agree that there is evidence for design in nature. Some of us skeptics are interested in exploring the potential models where ID and non-common ancestry histories of life intersect. Design does not rise or fall with these models, but they are an interesting questions to explore. So, <clears throat> I want to note that in the past, I, I've not really grouped theistic evolutionists or the folks that allow for common ancestry sort of in the intelligent design umbrella. There are intelligent design advocates that accept common ancestry. To my understanding, I think Michael Behe does. It's either him or Stephen Meyer. I can't quite remember. It's been a while since I've dipped my toe into the ID community. But that being said, ID here at intelligent design website Evolution News, they actually distinguish between theistic evolution and common ancestry accepting intelligent design. And as far as I understand, the difference between the two on this website is intelligent design advocates that accept common ancestry 
still propose that design is evident and allow for like a tinkerer god at play or an a tinkerer agent. Whereas the theistic evolutionists kind of take the opinion that God implements or an intelligent designer implements evolution as a mechanism and then kind of lets it go, winds it up and lets it go. So the chance processes within evolution occur basically the same as in conventional science. What I'll say here is that the idea of design being implemented into nature is an interesting question to explore, but we've already explored it, and we've been able, based off of the data, to reject at least the ideas of intelligent design put forward in the past up to present. We're going to get to that, because this is going to be a video where, where we tackle some of the bigger concepts of intelligent design and why I feel that it sucks. So let's continue. Critiquing the critique. Erica's first critique can be summarized as a complete misunderstanding of ID proponents' objections to the paper. We'll deal with that in a post tomorrow. Before we move forward, I want to talk for a minute about the paper that me and Emily are arguing over. It's the one in the background titled Statistical Evidence for Common Ancestry Application to Primates by Baum et al. from 2016. And basically what this paper did is it took data from morphologic, molecular, and biogeographic sets, and it compared the statistical support for common ancestry based off of the signals we see in these data versus separate ancestry at the species level, where God creates every species individually, and separate ancestry at the family level, where God creates each family separately, and then they can kind of evolve within their family groups. And uh, it was a pretty damning study for young earth creationism, certainly, but I argued also for intelligent design because it, of course, places humans very firmly within this group of other animals. Emily has kindly linked the timestamp where I completely misunderstand the ID proponent's objections. So because I have the memory of a tardigrade, let's see what I said. Okay, so thing number one that they're mad about is they feel like they've been straw manned because to them, Common ancestry is one idea, and then the idea that most ID proponents hold is that you've got a separate creation, a separate ancestry for these major groups, and then I guess they think that God tinkered along the way. So the paper, in their opinion, presented this one, right, where God comes and he creates a separate kind, and then chance takes over and evolves organisms to their current states that we see today. They think instead that their position is better defined as this. God creates the original separate ancestor, and then it isn't chance guiding these change, these changes between the organisms that we see today, but rather design choices by a tinkerer. So as you can see, I characterized Emily's objection to the paper as having not incorporated an actively tinkering agent, but she actually has a different problem with the paper that I didn't address, so put a pin in that. Moving on. Her second critique, her meaning me, is that ID proponents shouldn't expect others to test their models, but should test the models themselves. Uh, this is just true. If you're proposing an idea, especially if it goes against the general paradigm, it is your job to do the primary testing. Uh, anyone is welcome to test ID concepts if they like, but I don't think that ID proponents were expecting Baum et al. 2016 to test the hypothesis of separate ancestry. Rather, the paper carried out the normal scientific process where one group of scientists tests another group's scientific hypothesis independently. So like the peer review style thing, peer reviewing an idea uh, by testing it. Only in this case, they tested a hypothesis no one supports. More on that later. Pause. As I said in my original video, Folks at Answers in Genesis, young earth creationists, do support the idea of family level separate ancestry. Um, I don't think very many hold to the species level separate ancestry, but there are folks out there who hold the general idea of these created kinds. Uh, but she says more on that later, so we'll, we'll get there. Perhaps more important, ID proponents are involved in testing models of separate ancestry, and the example here was provided in the original post. The example that she gives is the same paper I already critiqued, it's Ewert et al, but we'll get to that too. As you can see, this is kind of laying out where this series of posts is going to go. We're putting a lot of pins in things. Her third critique responded to my key point. There are two known mechanisms, design and ancestry, that can produce genetic similarity. Therefore, genetic similarity should not always be used to provide exclusive support for ancestral relatedness when other explanations 
are possible. To elaborate on her third critique, Erica argues that there is no genetic demarcation or separation that would mark a stopping place for comparison between species and higher orders of phyla. She is clearly ignoring reproductive barriers here. Okay, pause. In the past, I've talked about reproductive barriers and why I think that they and the entire biological species concept is dumb and bad and doesn't work consistently <clears throat> to separate species through space and time. But let's continue because I kind of want to address this all as a whole. Well, I don't think this argument addresses my bolded point. I'm quite curious what she imagines this stopping point would look like if, in fact, separate ancestry were correct. I speculate that in such cases, people expect the only evidence for a discontinuity in biological relatedness would be a vastly different genetic code for each organism or species. This seems to me a false expectation because human technology shows that even separately designed structures can have deep similarities that go down to their very blueprints or encoding information. Given that, a design hypothesis would lead us to expect functional similarities. I would also say that there are reasons that a good design would make use of highly similar genetic codes for all organisms. Okay, so that's a lot and I have a lot to say about it. I think it makes sense to start with what is Emily saying? And to my understanding, this is the idea. Emily's intelligent design idea allows for the possibility of separate ancestry amongst organisms in the tree of life because similarities could be due to common design. So most smartphones have a touch screen these days and they're not all literally related to one another. They just have touch screens because it makes it easier for them to fill their specific niche which is allowing me to browse Reddit instead of getting important things done. Similarly, Emily might argue something like a howler monkey and a langur, because they have very similar habitats and they do similar things in those habitats, it only makes sense that their genetic code should reflect this. The genetic code is meeting the needs of the animal in its given environment. So its similarity is due not to common descent, but common design. And I have two massive problems with this. The first, Emily notes, she notes that I kind of brought it up in my previous video, but she doesn't really address it. So let's back up a second and assess. Emily, to my understanding, and I'm using her as a stand-in for other ID proponents at Evolution News and within the scientific community at large, allows for some level of common ancestry. For example, I think Emily would accept that all humans are related. I think she would accept that all dogs are related and probably that dogs are related to wolves. The way that we tell that two humans are more closely related than two other humans is by using genomic comparisons. The more similar the genomes are to one another, the more closely related the individuals are. This makes sense, and it follows Mendel's laws of inheritance to a T. But ID proponents like Emily allude to something confusing here. They seem to suggest that at some point there is separate ancestry, or at least there could be. What does that look like genetically, though? Well, from what she said here, it looks exactly the same as evolution. The genetic similarities between two closely related people aren't due to common design, despite the fact that the people are living in similar niches, but the similarities between the howler monkey and the langur could be due to common design. So my first problem here, obviously, is that we don't have any criteria at all to tell the difference between what ID proponents consider to be common design and what they accept as common descent. And again, she notes this. Eric argues that there is no genetic demarcation or separation that would mark a stopping place for comparison between species and higher orders of phyla. Then she goes on to say she's clearly ignoring reproductive barriers here. All right, so like I said previously, this is in reference to something called the biological species concept. And I don't think that this works for Emily as kind of this demarcation of the separation of what is designed and what is evolved, what is allowable to be evolved under her idea of intelligent design. And the reason is twofold. One, there are many organisms that we accept generally as separate species that can interbreed and produce viable offspring. Lions and tigers, classic example. Some ligers are reproductively viable and can produce offspring of their own. 
The American paddlefish and Russian sturgeon, another example, these are two animals that have been geographically isolated for millions of years, and yet they can still reproduce with one another. The other issue with this as your demarcation is that we have seen reproductive isolation emerge in nature and in the lab. So using this as your sort of stopgap for what denotes what nature can do and what design needs to step in and take care of doesn't work. In fact, in another article, which we'll touch upon in a second, it notes that ID or intelligent design aims to discriminate between objects generated by material mechanisms and those caused by intelligence. So if reproductive barriers can be created by natural processes like evolution, then it's not going to be due to design, even under the intelligent design model. But after throwing out reproductive isolation as like this, well, you know, maybe it could work. Emily goes on to say this. Well, I don't think this argument addresses my bolded point above. I'm quite curious what she imagines this stopping point would look like if in fact separate ancestry were correct. I speculate that in such cases, people expect the only evidence for a discontinuity in biological relatedness would be a vastly different genetic code for each organism or species. Okay. Well, Emily, I got some great news. We actually do know what this biological discontinuity should look like, and we've tested several ideas using it. Allow me to explain. So here I would like to note first that Dan over at Creation Myths did a great breakdown of this subject already, so please be sure to go like, comment, and subscribe over there. All organisms have a genome, right? This is pretty intuitive. But within the genome, there are both constrained and unconstrained sequences. Constrained sequences are sequences of base pairs where the order of these base pairs actually matters with regard to functionality. In unconstrained sequences, the order does not matter and doesn't really impact the phenotype at all. Now, Emily argues that generally, common design can accommodate a nested hierarchy with regard to appealing to the functionality of certain organisms within their given habitats. This is not the case, however, with this particular example, because common design and common descent each make two very specific predictions with regard to unconstrained sequences. If all organisms are related back to a single universal common ancestor, then both constrained sequences and unconstrained sequences alike should fall into nested hierarchies regardless of their functionality. This is due to the nature of inheritance. If, however, common design is the reason for phenotypic or physical similarities between organisms, and instead of a single common ancestor, there are perhaps several created common ancestors of all of the basic, say, family groups within life, then while the constrained sequences should form a nested hierarchy because they're related to the function of an organism within its habitat, the unconstrained sequences should be entirely uncorrelated. Let me explain a bit further by using an example. If an intelligent designer created an ancient canine that gave rise to all canids and an ancient bear that gave rise to all ursids, then the mutations in both the constrained and unconstrained sequences within the family Canidae and within the family Ursidae should each form nested hierarchies within their groups because each group shares a common created ancestor. However, the mutations in unconstrained sequences between the family Canidae and Ursidae should not be correlated at all because these regions do not tend to be functional and because these groups under intelligent design do not share a common ancestor. So what do we see? Well, I think you know the answer to that question. Both constrained and unconstrained sequences across the entire tree of life form nested hierarchies. One of the best examples of this can be seen in herbs or endogenous retroviruses, which recapitulate the primate phylogeny seen in constrained sequences to a T. And this is the case with other selectively neutral areas of the genome as well. Dan mentioned wobble sites in his video. Really the only alternative explanation that an intelligent design advocate might bring to the table here is that God just so happened to tinker along the way and make it look like evolution. Because again, these nested hierarchies are forming both in the constrained, highly functional areas of the genome and in unconstrained areas, which are most informative with regard to ancestry. This would truly be a situation where God is just making it look like evolution 
Because in my previous video, I made the comparison to last Thursdayism, saying that if God makes it look like evolution, there's no way to tell whether or not anything in the natural world is actually representative of any natural processes. It could be that God just created everything with the illusion of a history. Emily Reeves touches on this too. In the section of her article titled Last Thursdayism, she says, in this part of her argument, Erica also discusses Last Thursdayism. She says, because a seemingly hierarchical pattern exists, if separate ancestry were correct, the designer must be deceptive to lead us to such a pattern. If you aren't familiar with Last Thursdayism, it is a concept that the creator God can make things look a certain way, billions of years old, for example, even if he created everything last Thursday. Well, that while I agree that there are problems with Last Thursdayism, Last Thursdayism isn't relevant in this case. There are straightforward reasons to expect some degree of tree-like patterns, even in a non-common ancestry-related data set. If the seemingly deceptive pattern exists for a functional reason and has a good design explanation, then there really isn't a deceptive pattern. The deceptive pattern is imposed only by materialist lenses and a poor understanding of functional reasons for these similarities. So, as I hope I demonstrated just moments ago, this simply isn't the case because we also have these nested hierarchies in what are effectively functionless areas of the genome. There is absolutely no reason for this to be the case unless one, common ancestry is in fact true, or two, God has created a deceptive pattern. Emily would need to show that even unconstrained areas of the genome are all universally and ubiquitously functional. And we already know that this isn't the case because of knockout tests on organisms like mice, where we can knock out entire portions of the genome and the animal can breed and reproduce with seemingly no dire consequences. She says, to summarize the problems with her, meaning me, third critique, as emphasized in my original post, we know and observe two mechanisms that can result in genetic similarity. Design is one, and ancestry is the other. Because two known mechanisms exist to produce genetic similarity, that means in and of itself the genetic similarity does not provide evidence for ancestral relatedness. Except again, it does when it's nested in both constrained and unconstrained areas of the genome. This is something that Emily does not go over at all in any of these articles. She discusses general genetic similarities, not nested hierarchies in constrained and unconstrained regions alike. She says certain patterns of genetic similarity may do this, but a design pattern which isn't randomness was not considered in the Bomb et al. 2016 paper and isn't being considered by many in the academic community. That's what ID proponents are trying to change. Erica's fourth critique is that Winston Ewart's dependency graph is not an actual model of separate ancestry. Winston's central thesis is that the nested hierarchical pattern observed in the subsets of genes is better accounted for by a dependency graph. Erica acknowledges this is outside of her field, but she quotes Joshua Swamidas to dismiss it as a model. I'll talk more about her specific points in a later post. Okay, we'll get there when we get there. Finally, Erica's last point is to address my argument that Baum et al. cherry-picked which genes they would use when constructing their phylogeny and only used genes they claimed were phylogenetically informative, which could imply a stacked deck. She didn't really address my argument and instead made a comment about orphan genes. Uh, the comment about orphan genes was relevant, though, because Emily pointed out that orphan genes are species-specific and thus would count against common ancestry if you're using it in a statistical analysis, which, like, yeah, but they're species specific. So unless you want to suggest that God created every species separately, it's not informative for any kind of ancestry, whether it's within created groups or under a common ancestry lens. She goes on to say, I do not feel that Erica has provided evidence for how experimental or why conceptual common design could not result in the genetic similarities between species. I thought I did so rather concisely, but I'm going to remedy that and be even more concise in this video. Instead, there is evidence of design-dependent genetic similarity exploding all around me. She gives several examples, citing artificial selection for dogs and recumbent DNA in a lab and CRISPR-Cas9. These are all proof of principle examples that design can and does produce genetic similarity in different organisms. Because this mechanism is well established, when we observe genetic similarity, we can't refuse to include design in the conversation. In my next post, I will explain why I think Gutzik was confused about the objection I raised previously to the separate ancestry model in Baum et al. 2016 and attempt to explain the ID position more clearly. So with that, let's move on to the next article. In Emily's second article, which is titled Why Their Separate Ancestry Model is Wildly Unrealistic, 
she criticizes my assessment of sort of her assessment of Bomb et al. 2016. And I understand that that is kind of confusing, so let's go through it together. What a horrible screenshot here. It's not her fault. My lighting is bad. I take full responsibility. So she says, here's what Erica, aka Gutsa Gibbon, is saying. In the diagram above, she has two different models of what creationists on the left and intelligent design proponents on the right might be saying. So this is true. On the left in this picture, we have God creating a progenitor kind and then that kind evolving into other extant forms. This is really what Baum et al. 2016 was testing. And my impression was that Emily was upset that we tested this one, this one on the left, and not the one on the right that involves tinkering throughout the process and thus Baum et al. 2016 did not accurately represent the intelligent design model in any way. But what Emily says is, she says, each finger in the diagram is supposed to represent an instance where the designer acted to influence the course of biological history. The left truth is supposed to show what she thinks the creationist model is that was tested by Baum. She mistakenly thinks that the ID proponents are angry because we're really putting forth a model like the diagram on the right, where the designer creates a group but then allows evolutionary tinkering. But it's not evolutionary tinkering, it's the designer tinkering. So she thinks we're upset because Baum et al. 2016 didn't include tinkering in their model. This is actually not the case. When I argued that Baum et al. 2016 failed to properly test separate ancestry, that had nothing to do with the failure to incorporate tinkering. As a side note, ID proponents do not advocate a tinkering hypothesis. Keep this in mind, because this is going to be important for later. Also, as this, er, this is a common misconception about the ID view. Instead, the primary objection of ID proponents to the Baum et al. paper is due to how the separate ancestry and family separate ancestry models were created in the first place. In short, Baum et al. assumes that shuffling of synapomorphies is an accurate model for separate ancestry. ID proponents and others who have a design-based perspective would heartily reject that for reasons I will explain. So she's going to get into how we pick the data. In the section how they chose data for the separate ancestry model, Emily investigates where the molecular data actually came from in Baum et al. 2016. And she notes that it comes from a 2011 paper by Perelman et al. where they used 54 genes. And Emily kind of implies that this is less than ideal when compared to using the 30,000 genes that all primates have or around all primates have. And to this, I say, yes, it would be ideal if we could do full genomic comparisons among all primates. But to do that, we would have to have the fully sequenced genomes of all primates. Here, it is critical to note for Emily that of the primates whose genomes we have completely sequenced, we still get a nested hierarchy with humans being most closely related to panins and panins being most closely related to humans, putting them in the same general ancestral group, and then gorillas, and then orangutans, etc., etc., all the way up. And that this is, again, within both constrained and unconstrained regions. So whether or not we're using all the genes or not, this is still problematic for intelligent design advocates who suppose that humans are separate from the rest of the apes or that all the primates aren't related. So she goes through and talks about a little bit in detail about where these genes came from. And then she goes on to explain it a bit more. She talks about the type of filtering, which is basically her word for saying which genes were and which genes were not used within the study, and discusses uh, that genes need to be within databases, be of sufficient size, and exist in all the species being considered. This is very reasonable. And then she discusses that they need to have phylogenetically informative sites. So synapomorphies. So synapomorphy is a trait that's held by two descended groups and their uh, proposed ancestor. And having phylogenetically important genes being included in the study where you don't have the full genomes of everything involved is just the best way of doing it. So I don't really know why she's taking problem with it at this juncture, but she does go on to explain a bit further. After making a chair analogy, she goes on in the section titled, They Use Synapomorphy Shuffling to Test Separate Ancestry, and summarizes her sort of issue as well as what Baum et al. did here at the bottom. First, she says, now the authors Baum et al. 2016 constructed their separate ancestry model by permuting, shuffling the synapomorphies of these sequences, figure 1b, in a random manner, which assumed there would be no reason to find correlations of traits across different organisms. Here's how they describe their methods. And then she cites uh, an excerpt from Baum et al. 2016. 
She summarizes after synapomorphy shuffling is not a good test of separate ancestry and in now the longer answer that Baum et al. 2016's error is therefore as follows. They assume that design must produce random distributions of traits. However, all of our experience with sets of design systems show that this is not the case. Erica does not appreciate this point and thus she misunderstands our critique of the Baum et al. paper. So to simplify it, Emily's gripe is that Baum et al. imposed randomness on the design model where she would propose that there is kind of a pseudo nested hierarchy, kind of reflective of how humans design due to the requirements of functionality of these organisms within their own environments. So here is the problem with that. Emily presumably does not propose that God created every single organism living today as a creation event. Like most intelligent design proponents, I am assuming here, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, that Emily allows for some evolution or changes within groups in accordance with how the environment changes around them. I don't think many intelligent design proponents don't accept mutation and natural selection. If this is the case, then the extant organisms that exist today descend from common ancestors. They descend within their own created groups from some kind of created organism that was made at some point in the past by God. If that is the case, then because the organisms exist today were not the created groups, the differences between them are a result of nature, meaning they should be random and uncorrelated unless Emily is proposing that God is actively tinkering along the way, which she, remember, has abjectly said she and other ID proponents do not support. Let's take the gulo break in primates as an example. All haplorine primates have a broken gulo gene, which means they cannot synthesize their own vitamin C. Now, guinea pigs also have a broken gulo gene but it's broken in a different way and in a different place as compared to haplorine primates. So let's apply this to Emily's idea of separate ancestry. Unless Emily proposes that all haplorine primates are a part of a single created group, and I don't suppose that she does because that would mean that humans are related to the rest of the primates, then that means each created group of haplorine primates, whatever those groups may be, has to have broken their gulo gene in the exact same place, in the exact same way, and at the exact same time without the influence of a tinkerer god. Nature is again responsible. The odds of that statistically are not great. In this way, Baum et al. 2016 was entirely appropriate in its treatment of separate ancestry. It's entirely within the scope of what intelligent design advocates suppose. I don't think it's fair to say that there is no tinkering and separate ancestry is not at the species level and then get upset when separate lineages are treated as independent. Because again, recalling from our example with the gulo gene, there's no functional reason as to why all the haplorine primates have to have this gene broken in the exact same way, place, and at the exact same time. This is all relatively beside the point, however, because remember, unconstrained sequences which lack functions also form nested hierarchies, which means they shouldn't be correlated at all all, nor should their mutations be, within Emily's idea of intelligent design. Emily finishes this article by saying, thus I hold that the model of separate ancestry rejected in the Baum et al. 2016 paper is not endorsed by most in the ID community because it does not account for the design expectation that functional synapomorphies or traits will cluster due to optimization constraints and a need for compatibility. Of course, as we just went over, this doesn't really matter because one, unconstrained sequences also form these nested hierarchies, and two, the Baum et al. paper was appropriate in that it tested for selective constraints and assumed that at least at the family level, God wasn't tinkering. In the next article titled, Just How Well Does That Cherry-Picked Data Fit an Evolutionary Tree? Emily Reeves does some weird stuff. And I'm not trying to dunk on you, Emily. Well, I am, but not in a mean way. But I, I genuinely don't know why you did the things you did in this article. So she summarizes what she said in the previous post. And then she goes on to talk about an ideal world. 
And in this section, she says, in, lurk, in looking at the Perelman data set, so the Perelman data set is the 54 genes used in BOM 2016, she says, in that data set, nine of the 54 genes were pulled from this paper titled Murphy et al., or by Murphy et al., uh, in 2001. And she says, of these nine genes, we can see what their consistency indexes are. And she says, consistency indexes are calculated by taking the minimum possible number of steps to build a tree divided by the observed number of steps. In an ideal world, you would think that your CIs would be close to one because it's generally from zero to one. It is from zero to one. That's what your CIs are going to be. Uh, and she said the minimum number of steps should be close to the observed. So a CI of one would mean that all 54 genes fit consistently within the same primate evolutionary tree, but a CI of zero suggests that the similarities are no better than completely random data. But why are we talking about the 54 genes here when we only have the CIs for nine of the genes? Because she's directing us to Murphy et al. 2001. I don't know why she did that. It feels a little like a bait and switch to me. But she goes on to say, if you look at table one from Murphy et al., you will see the estimated consistency indexes for 16 gene-based trees are between 0.25 and 0.65, with the average being 0.40. So this paper is accessible to anybody through ResearchGate, so we are well within our copyright bounds here. And the paper is titled Molecular Phylogenetics and the Origin of Placental Mammals. So it makes sense as to why the number of genes applicable to primates is significantly fewer than in the Perelman data set, because this is looking at all placental mammals. In fact, they note some of the major groups that they're looking at um, and how their analysis actually parsed everything out. It says phylogenetic analyses identify four primary superordinal clades, uh, Aphrotheria, Xenarthra, Gliers, and um, the remaining orders of placental mammals. So we're very broad here, not nearly as specific as the Perelman data set, which is looking within the order primates. This is looking way broader than that. So here are those CIs from table one. In fact, here's table one that Emily is referring to, and she's right, like these CIs are pretty low. The bootstrap numbers are very high, but interestingly enough, they kind of address what's in table one. They go, we also perform phylogenetic analysis with the combined amino acid sequences from the 11 coding nuclear genes, which provided medium to high support for the monophyly of most orders, as well as some superordinal relationships. For example, Aphrotheria, uh, Panangelata, Gliers, and the split between Aphrotheria plus Anarthra versus other placentals, see supplementary information. However, these data lacked sufficient power to resolve the other basal relationships identified with the nucleotide data set. This is not unexpected given the amino acid data set contains less than 20% of the number of variable and parsimony informative sites present in the nucleotide data set. So compare that to the Perelman data set, which specifically focused on primates, specifically focused on phylogenetically informative genes, and specifically um, looked at making trees, right? Like this is trying to create a phylogenetic tree of these guys. So it says a comprehensive molecular phylogeny based off of 34,927 base pairs amplified for 54 nuclear genes in 191 taxa, including 186 primates, representing 61 genera, is presented. The phylogeny is highly resolved, with bootstrap values of 90 to 100% and Bayesian posterior probabilities of 0.9 to 1 at 166 of the 189 nodes. Further, only three of the 189 nodes are polytomes in the bootstrap analysis. Roughly equal amounts of coding and non-coding genomic regions were sampled from the X chromosome, Y chromosome, and autosomes. Newly developed PCR uh, primers derived from a uh, bioinformatics approach specific to primates in addition to primers from previous large-scale phylogenetic analysis. And you get this really nice tree that you can see here, the molecular phylogeny of 186 primates and four species representing two outgroup orders of Scangentia uh, and Dermoptera rooted by Legomorpha. So I'm not a statistician, but I think it's pretty telling that she chose to use the Murphy et al. 2001 data set instead of Perelman 2011. And the reason I think so is like, the Perelman data set used more genes, the genes were phylogenetically informative, and they were very much in agreement comparing these different trees within the analysis. So it's just kind of strange, right? And also the Perelman data set is 10 years more recent. So uh, mm, I don't know. I do not know. And it used Bayesian analysis. So eh, I'm not trying to impose motivations. I'm just 
curious is all. So we are in a strange gray area, Emily says, of the results where the data is more tree-like than Gutsy Gibbon thinks a design data set should be, but less tree-like than an ID proponent like me thinks it should be if it were produced by unguided descent. Using Murphy at all, I can see why she would make this case. But again, this is the more outdated study using fewer genes that are not as phylogenetically informative. Who is right? Well, this much I know. Guts at Gibbon and Baum et al. have imposed a totally unrealistic constraint upon a design data set, namely that the traits and synapomorphies must vary at random. But they have to, as we went over, unless you want a tinkerer or fully species separate ancestry. And then she basically goes on to say that she's going to further bet that a pro-ID computer scientist like Winston Ewart's dependency graph, which you can read about here and she links again, would provide a much better fit to this data. We're going to talk about Winston Ewart's model again in just a second, but like also just, just test it yourself if you want to prove that. Moving on. Her next article is titled, Yes, Winston Ewart's Dependency Graph is a Real Model. So let's investigate this, shall we? She says, in my previous post responding to YouTuber Gutsy Gibbon, aka Eric I linked to Winston Ewart's 2018 biocomplexity article, The Dependency Graph of Life, as a more technical explanation of how common design can yield a data set with some tree-like structure. Winston's central thesis is that a nested hierarchical pattern as observed in subsets of genes is better accounted for by a dependency graph, which reflects the fact that programmers reuse similar coding modules in different independent systems to fulfill similar functional needs. And then basically I read Winston Ewart's paper. A lot of it went over my head because that is not my background. And so I went around to see what other folks whose background it is had to say and lots of folks at Peaceful Science, which is a forum for scientists of many walks of life to discuss, basically trashed the paper and was like, there are aspects of this that are essentially indistinguishable from conventional science and evolutionary theory. So it fails as a model for intelligent design. It, it is indistinguishable from regular old science. It's just an assertion that is meeting the, the data. Um, and also on Todd Wood's blog. Todd Wood is a young Earth creationist, and he also found problems with Ewart's model. Uh, and she quotes me and says, but then Winston's Ewart's model is not really a model that's actually distinguishable from evolution, just like intelligent design is not distinguishable from evolution. Um, and this is a pattern that I've noticed. The more that intelligent design has to accommodate new data, the more it just is evolution, but maybe there's a tinkerer. And then Emily goes on to say, Winston's model is actually distinguishable from evolution as he wrote in his paper that first described the dependency graph model. And she reads, she provides an excerpt and kind of summarizes by saying, this model predicts a distinct pattern from common descent. As an example, the dependency graph predicts that modules not corresponding to taxonomic categories, i.e. reusage of components in a manner that doesn't fit a tree, should be abundant in case you would like to read the conclusion of Winston's work, and she provides his conclusion here. This says the predictions of the dependency graph hypothesis set out in this paper have been shown to be correct. The biological data was a better fit to the dependency graph than to the tree. The data produced by a simulated process of a common descent was better fit to a tree than to a dependency graph. The data produced by a compiler was both a better fit to a dependency graph than to a tree and a better fit to a tree than to the null model. The inferred biological dependency graphs contained were not simply to the trees of life with a few additions, but instead contained many additional modules. So she's basically making the case that Ewart's model makes a prediction that is distinct from common descent and that the data better matches that model. This assertion is made in part based off of the observation that phylogenetic data doesn't always agree on a single tree pattern and sometimes doesn't even form a tree pattern at all. But then she goes on to kind of elaborate on this claim and address the arguments against it. The arguments that are generally presented against Ewart's model and presented in favor of common ancestry despite the observation that phylogenetic data doesn't always agree on a single tree and sometimes doesn't form a tree pattern is that we have mechanisms within common ancestry that we know result in these discrepancies. She says here, one interesting observation by Erica, of course, I stole this from Joshua Swamidas over on Peaceful Science, is that human diversity doesn't always show a tree pattern. And this is true. We also have something called incomplete lineage sorting, which creates issues for traditional phylogenetic data sets as well. She says the argument is that even in a case where we all agree on common ancestor, we don't necessarily find a tree like data set. This is true. We don't. Then she says, it is supposed to get common descent off the hook, so it isn't falsified or challenged in the numerous other cases where the data isn't tree-like. 
A couple of points in response. Before we address this, we simply have to talk about the elephant in the room. She basically just solved her own problem and then said that isn't good enough. If there are observable mechanisms that can cause phylogenetic data not to form a tree pattern within the constraints of common descent, then that just can explain the cases where the data isn't tree-like. She goes on to say, common ancestry historically has predicted a tree-like pattern. This is absolutely true. Then she says, if it doesn't, then why does virtually every phylogenetic study evaluate the consistency index, i.e. why does it report statistics that tell us how tree-like the data set is? So pause, because most of the time, overwhelmingly most of the time, the pattern is tree-like, just as common ancestry predicts. When it isn't tree-like, it meets the diagnostic criteria for the exceptions, like incomplete lineage sorting, for example, or cases when you have hybridization after a speciation event has already occurred. It's not just willy-nilly appealing to other mechanisms, it has to meet those characteristics. And this really flattergasts me, because then she says too, now it's true that there are known processes in biology that can produce non-tree-like patterns, but it remains the case that the more tree-like a data set is, the more confidence we have that it was produced by common ancestry. So what was the point of this entire article, right? Like if we have mechanisms that can produce types of patterns that Ewart previously said could only be explainable by his data set, what, what conversation is there to be had here? She says, many data sets may land in the gray zone where skeptics may feel like they're too untree-like to be produced by common ancestry, and believers in common ancestry feel like they're too tree-like to be produced by common design. Many conversations remain to be had, but whatever the answer is, we need realistic assessments of what design-based models would predict. I hope this post helped move the conversation forward in a positive manner. Then she says, before concluding the series tomorrow, I will finish this for now. The fact that no natural biologic processes can produce non-tree-like patterns is problematic, not for ID proponents, but for the proponents of common ancestry. If, when we know genetic inheritance is occurring, we don't see a tree-like pattern, then what does that say about our ability to test or demonstrate common ancestry? The presence of non-tree-like data, however, is not a problem for ID proponents that challenge common ancestry. That is because we feel we can count for genetic similarity better through common design. Okay, what? We have mechanisms that have diagnostic characteristics, like for instance, incomplete lineage sorting, that can explain when the data does not fit the tree-like pattern within the constraints of common descent. Like this is just, common descent can still be the case and you can have non-tree-like patterns. And this is just not an issue. So I don't know why we're talking about it. Moreover, what about the unconstrained DNA? I have to bring it up again because the, the same argument that she's making in this last paragraph could be posed to her with unconstrained sequences. Why is it that unconstrained sequences form nested hierarchies just like constrained sequences do? Common ancestry can accommodate both. ID can only accommodate the constrained sequences within their design model. So the summary of this sort of article is that Emily proposes challenges to common ancestry in the form of data that doesn't fit the tree-like pattern and then turns around and says, yeah, we know that there are biological reasons why this might be the case, but my point still stands. But the point doesn't still stand. Finally, we wrap things up with the article titled, Let's Do Assumption-Free Science. Hmm. Some concluding thoughts on Guts at Gibbons' challenge. So I do, again, it's impossible to not at least get me to move a little bit more into the friendly zone when we've got adorable pictures of gibbons like this very handsome looking lar but let me try to keep my head on straight here and let's read this conclusion in a series of posts she lists the post i've been responding to youtuber guts of gibbon aka erica on the question of whether or not the paper by bomb at all proposed a reasonable test of separate ancestry model she says i hope i've convinced you my reader that they did not the requirement that separate ancestry involves random distributions of traits has not been proposed by ID proponents and is at odds with how human designers design things. The statistical zeros that Baum et al. 2016, which Erica herself declared as insane, are a testament not to the unlikelihood of separate ancestry, but to the poor design of their test of the separate ancestry model. She says, shuffling functional synapomorphies and traits data that cluster due to optimization or constraints is not a valid model of separate ancestry. That is because it goes against everything we know about how design works. Design technology contains components with correlations and patterns that, when viewed through the phylogenetic lens, can yield some degree of tree-like data. 
This does not mean that they arose due to common ancestry. It means they arose due to common design to meet functional requirements. What ID proponents are encouraging in the greater scientific community is honesty about the fact that both design and ancestry can create genetic similarity. We are saying that everyone needs to think differently about the hierarchical signal we observe in life. In a nutshell, let's start by doing assumption-free science in phylogenetics, where one doesn't a priori exclude design as a reasonable hypothesis. As I have noted, intelligent design does not rise or fall with common ancestry, for intelligent design proponents have different views on that question. However, I trust that I have made it abundantly clear that ID proponents and others who question common ancestry have excellent scientific reasons for doing so. So, as I said previously multiple times in this video, all of this falls apart with the fact that unconstrained sequences without function also form nested hierarchies. This is completely flying in the face of every prediction intelligent design on the basis of functionality would make. And of course, it denies the human examples as well with humans designing in these patterns, because again, these sequences don't have functions, or at least they overwhelmingly do not tend to. Again, to falsify this, Emily would have to show that all unconstrained sequences have function, which I don't think they can do because we've already shown that the genome is not fully functional on the basis of things like knockout tests. But I want to talk about something else in this section before we at least begin to wrap things up. And it all boils down to this last little sentence here. The sentence that says, in a nutshell, let's start doing assumption-free science in phylogenetics where one doesn't a priori exclude design as a reasonable hypothesis. Assumption-free science by assuming a designer. This is something that kind of blows my mind, right? Because we don't have any kind of empirical evidence that a designer actually exists on the scale of one that can manipulate life as a tinkerer or even create life on a whim. This is assumed to be the case. The only assumptions that are made in common ancestry, and I truly do mean this, the only assumptions made in common ancestry are that genetics continues to work the same way through time, that there isn't an arbitrary stopping point. And we know that there isn't one, again, because of unconstrained DNA, as well as the processes at work today. I don't think that it is those advocates of common descent who are making assumptions here. I commend Emily for making this series of articles because it shows that she is trying. She is at least trying to deal with the data in a way that is empirical. Unfortunately, intelligent design is not science and should not be considered alongside evolutionary theory as a scientific idea. This is where we get into some of the sort of bigger concepts behind intelligent design. What does intelligent design need in order to be legitimately considered alongside evolutionary theory and common descent? We could go by some of the classic ideas. We could assert that it needs to be of natural origin. It needs to be regularly observable, and it has to be falsifiable. Okay, well, intelligent design in its current form meets exactly none of these criteria. For one, it is it natural? If God or some other sort of supernatural, above natural agent truly is involved in tinkering, then we can't really see any means by which it's operating under natural mechanisms. It isn't observable in any way that we can tell at present, and in its current form, it's also not falsifiable. Okay, so that means that intelligent design, in order to be considered alongside evolutionary theory and common descent in any legitimate sort of way, it needs to have some kind of natural component to it. And by this, I mean it needs to have an aspect or aspects that can be investigated empirically within the natural world. Intelligent design advocates like Emily may propose here that this aspect is design itself that design is naturally observed in all life, from cells to sea lions. But to this, I say no. And this is because design here is simply asserted without any criteria by which to really designate it. An analogy might be something like beauty. I can assert that nature is in fact beautiful, and people might even agree, 
But this is not in any way a scientific observation because there's no empirical criteria by which to actually designate it, rank it, or score it. In this way, design, at least as observed by intelligent design advocates today, is not in fact scientific or natural. The frustrating thing here is that design can be empirical. We know this to be the case because we use physical criteria to denote design within the field of lithics. How do we tell a regular old rock from a hand axe created by ancient hominins? Well, hand axes actually have percussive fractures in them that can be identified. And we've seen these diagnostic characteristics on hand axes made experimentally by humans today, as well as on the hammers and anvils that chimpanzees use to crack open nuts. We can tell that some of these fractures can only be created by intentional directional smashing of two rocks together repeatedly. Ah, you're thinking, perhaps if you're Emily, but we have never observed the type of large-scale evolution proposed by conventional science. In this way, we can actually propose that nature cannot produce these forms and that it thus must be designed. Two problems. One, unlike in lithics, we don't know of any higher designer who's capable of creating life on a whim or even tinkering with it. Not in a scientific way anyways, not like we can do with lithics. We can, of course, run two rocks in together ourselves and see what kind of diagnostic characteristics they leave on one another, or we can simply observe chimpanzees manipulating rocks in nature through use. Two, we know that nature actually can produce these types of forms if we can extrapolate back into time based off of processes that are occurring today. Emily may not like it, but this is perfectly acceptable within science. A good example would be natural arches, and this is a good example because arches do in fact look designed, and we use arches in our own construction as intelligent agents. And yet, we can look at a natural arch, and based off of the processes of erosion and how wind works today, we can know that that arch was formed naturally without having to be there for its entire formation. We can look at the processes of mutation and selection and inheritance in the present and extrapolate them back into time. Better yet, we can draft hypotheses and predictions based off of current changes, and we can use these ideas to search for things like fossils, testing the ideas behind evolution. And sure enough, we find fossils using the quote-unquote evolutionary assumptions, and they do in fact meet the expectations that we laid out. Tiktaalik is, of course, the most famous example of this. So intelligent design in its current form is not naturally occurring. It lacks any kind of empirical criteria to find design in nature and parse it from other natural mechanisms. And intelligent design is, of course, not observable either. Some individuals who support intelligent design propose this idea of like a progressive creation. So there are major changes occurring within the fossil record, and these denote the designer's interactions with the natural world via, again, creation events. This is, of course, not happening in the present, but moreover, there is no criteria, again, to denote these creation events through time. We can't parse it as different from naturally occurring events. Now, is intelligent design falsifiable? Separate ancestry certainly is falsifiable, as we showed and demonstrated in this video, and it has been shown to be false. But intelligent design is different, because without a criteria for design and without specifications on what and how the designer is and interacts, I don't really think that we can falsify it. I don't really think it has an actual form that we can interact with in the sense that we can test it empirically. It's too nebulous. I suspect we could show the entire evolution of life in real time from abiogenesis all the way to present, and you would still have intelligent design advocates saying, well, you had to fine-tune the environment to get the abiogenesis in the first place. And at that point, it's pretty much indistinguishable from conventional science. And that's not a problem. I have no issue with science-affirming theism, which is a position that I continually try to make clear on this channel. However, the anti-common dissent science going on at Evolution News currently leaves 
a lot to be desired. So thank you so much, my gentle and of course very modern apes. And hopefully, Emily, you didn't get upset by this video. I'm not meaning to be insulting or mean or anything like that. I'm just offering some peer review. Make sure you leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.